Hi, my name is Hartnell Dean. I'm a Year 11 student in Stella Marsh College in Manly and I'm talking to Wing Commander Mike Elport. Mike, um, thank you for your service to the Commonwealth and uh, for sharing your story here today. Okay, well I'm delighted to meet you and I also feel uh, privileged um, to be asked to introduce this uh, program uh, saluting the services. To be here along with the, uh, some homegrown veteran heroes. What I'd like to do, Hartnell, is to um, give a little bit of my uh, background and, uh, and my RAF career and then hopefully take some questions um, from you later on. So uh, my father, now he was a, uh, a, a hero. He was a World War II Royal Air Force um, navigator and he won a Distinguished Service Order, which is one of the highest medals, highest order of medals for gallantry, um, alongside two Distinguished Flying Crosses. So I followed in my father's footsteps. But along the way, uh, I went to uh, a boarding school, and at the boarding school, I joined the Combined Cadet Force. Did you ever join anything like that at school? Yeah, actually at one of my schools that I've been to I was in the Army Cadets for about four years. Okay, right. Well, um, they formed an REF section uh, whilst I was there and I was um, being one of the senior boys, I rose to the rank of Flight Sergeant um, and in my time there I learned to glide at the age of 16 and I had a flying scholarship and I learnt to fly um, and got a private pilot's licence by the time I was 17 and that was flying in a tiger moth. Now these were my goggles for which I still have to this day. Leather helmet, goggles, so a tiger moth is a, is a, is a biplane, uh, came from between the wars, open cockpit um, and it was a lot of fun to fly. So logical that I should continue uh, to go, go in, into, into the Air Force. So um, uh, I enjoyed flying. The Royal Air Force had a lot of planes and I wanted to see the world. And I think from our chat before, you've seen a certain amount of the world. What are some of the countries that you've seen? Um, I've been to Japan. I've been quite like all across Europe pretty much and um, I've been to New Zealand, Fiji, just kind of everywhere, different cultures and everything, yeah. Okay, but not to Arabia? No. <laughs> okay, we'll cover a bit of Arabia a bit, bit later on. Anyway, um, I went to the REF College, uh, age 18, three years later I got my wings, my Royal Air Force wings, and then after my advanced flying training I was then what they called creamed off. I was then returned back into the training game to, to train as a qualified flying instructor and I found myself teaching um, students who were about the same age as me and in fact some of them were older than me because they'd been to university. Not only were they older, they'd been on university air squadrons and they had more flying hours than I did. So that was a bit novel, uh, that the instructor had less flying hours than the student. But anyway, we, we, we coped with that. Only did one tour of that because I needed to get out into the real Air Force, and that's when I joined um, the Hercules Force, or C-130, as many people call it, and uh, that's when I set about um, seeing the world. One of my first postings was out to this part of the world, actually at RAF Changi, uh, in Singapore. And this is where I met my first ADF person. Now this was at RAAF Butterworth, Penang Island, Malaysia, and I met him in the gents' toilet. Hold that thought, I will come back to that later. So. Um, I had, um, on return to the UK, uh, I was in, involved in multiple campaigns, um, not fighting campaigns, but famine relief in Mali. Um, I took the first 
Royal Air Force aircraft uh, into Timbuktu. And I don't know if it's got the same significance in Australia, but Timbuktu is, is almost a sort of a mythical place on the edge of the Sahara Desert. And um, so that was one of my firsts. And um, that was interesting. Flood relief into Bangladesh. Um, and that was when I was based in Singapore, flying up to Bangladesh. Now, the Royal Navy were also up there. And the Royal Navy, when they're at sea, they are very keen to get their mail. And we had their mail. So ha having dropped off supplies to the people who needed in Bangladesh, we were then instructed to come alongside the carrier, go on the starboard side of the aircraft, and a hundred yards, and drop it a hundred yards off, off the side of the, of the carrier. So being a show-off pilot, I went screaming round the uh, thing, leveled out um, probably about 200 feet, doing about 200 miles an hour, ready to drop this, when I saw that the Navy had already got their whaler in position and I would have sunk it, without a doubt. So one more bout round there came on a much wider circuit gave the chap a bit of rowing to do to pick up the mail, but it was better than me killing him and sinking, sinking his boat. So a bit of light relief, and we always enjoy working with the Navy. I continued for some time on the Hercules, and having already been a qualified flying instructor, I, of course, became an instructor on the, on the Hercules. But my final um, flying tour was actually as the officer commanding the meteorological Research flight. Can you say meteorological? Meteorological. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, good. Work. I'm glad we both. Ha <laughs> well, I'm glad we both had problems with that. Uh, I was actually had to speak to the queen, queen mother, at one point, and she asked me what I did, and I had the greatest difficulty saying meteorological to her. But uh, we we move move on. Um, so, for this. I had a specially modified Hercules. It had a long nose on it with instruments on it. I had um, in the fuselage packed full of instruments and scientists um, all taking readings for the MET research we were doing. And we also had a Canberra photo recce um, bomber, light, light bomber, um, and that too had a long nose, and that was for doing high level work. So it was, it was a good combination, a, a very, very interesting little phase. After that, and you do come to a phase when you stop flying and then you get into the staff appointments, and I was um, looking after joint theatre plans which were written to evacuate British nationals and other nationals from a hotspot. Oh. Now, I'd only been in the job for two days when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. So we'd done nothing with this plan. It certainly wasn't my fault <laughs> that we hadn't done anything with the plan, and we, uh, we then had, had to deal with it. But um, it, it did, did give me uh, a bit, bit of an insight into uh, you know, what went around, around the bazaars, and I made a point of visiting as many of the places that I had plans for. So I went up and down Africa and, and uh, saw places supposedly so to help me write my plan. Coming to the Arabian bit, I had two, two tours um, in Arabia. Um, the first one, I was a loan service officer. Now, this was a loan service officer to the Dubai Air Force, a tiny little air force, but actually quite an important one, because the other title which I enjoyed was to be the project officer for a new air base. Now, whilst I was there, this was a big secret, and it was only ever known as QR336 for the whole of the time I was there. And um, I did explain to my Arab colleagues that it's very difficult to keep a, an airfield secret because there will be a clue of things going on. But anyway, QR336, it remained, and... What I am particularly delighted at is this airbase, now known as Minad Air Base, is actually used by the coalition forces, particularly by the Australians. They have almost the biggest um, presence um, at, at Minhad. And I can also tell you that they also have the best messing. 
they produced the best tucker. Uh, and so the British didn't even, it didn't compete. We didn't even bother with a mess. We used to go straight down to the Australians here. So once again, getting more contact uh, with the Australian Air Force. Um, seven years later, I returned, this time to the capital of the UAE in Abu Dhabi, as the Air Attaché. When I went back to my old headquarters in Dubai, they thought I'd been on leave for seven years. <laughs> now, in Arabia, they can have leave for seven years, and, uh, they, and they go. And in fact, some of them will go to the States, they'll do a university thing and come back. So uh, I wasn't too upset about that. Um, but um, what, I, what I did find interesting is my old um, sort of equal ranked person that I'd worked with when I was on loan service by now has gone up three ranks. I've only gone up one, um, but we, he gets me in a great bear hug. We then walk the length of the headquarters hand in hand, which tells everybody else in the headquarters that I'm okay. So uh, that was, that's okay. Don't do a lot of hand holding. Um, and um, COVID-19, there we are. Um, I did earn my MBE. Now I talked about campaign, campaigns earlier on. Now I'm used to seeing the Australians and particularly the Americans with a, a great handful of medals. Yes. Um, in the Royal Air Force, we didn't go in for that sort of thing. Um, so I was delighted when I actually did get a proper medal, um, the MBE, mem uh, the, the Most Noble Order of the British Empire, uh, which was presented to me by the Queen. And um, so uh, I was quite proud of that. It is actually something that um, within our family, and my wife's name is Bunny, by the way, and the medal is referred to as Mike and Bunny's efforts because <laughs> it, it, was, it was something of a, of a, of a joint effort from a, a very loyal and supportive and long-suffering wife. So um, they kick you out of uh, the Air Force at age 55, out of active service, but I got a job as a retired officer and I was the international training officer based at the Royal Air Force College, which I'd started my career at and now I was gonna finish it there. But what it did do, it gave me an intro to civilian life because I'd never been off a base before and now I was living in a village and I was almost partly civilian because I wasn't full-time full military even though I was wearing the uniform. So I got, um, we got deeply involved in uh, village life and quickly I was a church warden, I was chairman of the church council, I was chairman of the local parish magazine um, I organize open gardens and uh, we had a large garden and a river bank and we served PIMS um, on, the, on the river bank and with my RAF connections because we had the Red Arrows, the RAF uh, formation team, you might have heard of them, I hope? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said yeah, yes, yeah. good, okay. Um, and the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight which had a lot of World War II uh, bombers um, and, and fighters. Both of those bases were within, within about 15 miles of where I lived. So if they were out doing a, a display somewhere else in the country for which people had paid a lot of money, they could pass back over my garden and that was all part of, part of the attraction. And uh, that was very good. And when, when you have nine red arrows coming up over your river bank, <laughs> smoke on the whole lot, it was chilling. But it was also great to have Spitfires, Hurricanes, and of course the Lancaster. Have you ha ever had any desire to go into the military? Um, from my cadets, I had an interest, but not anymore. But for a bit I did, yeah. I was very interested by it because I was doing my cadet training once a week for a few hours. Okay, good. Well, I'm very t happy to take any, any questions you, you, yes, you may have. I'd love to ask some questions. Yeah. Um, so do you have any particular memories from your long flying career that you would like to share with us? Right. Um, I particularly liked and respected paratroopers. Now anybody who jumps out of a moving aircraft 
there's got to be, uh, well, well, okay, I'll just say it, that commands my respect. But there was a particular time when the loadmaster, and the loadmaster is also the dispatcher for paratroopers, and he turned up on the flight deck and he said, I'm sorry, Captain, I forgot my teeth. And I thought, oh, that's, I don't mind that for me, but he's going to be the chap in front of the paratroopers sh shouting this lot out. But anyway, I don't know how he got on, but the main thing is there's a red light comes on, there's a green light, at them, and then he's there to help them push them out of the door. But it was one of those, those lighter moments. Bring your bloody teeth. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> um, but um, another trip which I, I thoroughly enjoyed, when the Queen was going to open the Commonwealth Conference in Lusaka, um, she needed a bag carrier. Now, when the Queen has bags, the Queen has bags. So we had a, a separate aircraft for the bags, oh and that gosh. was me in my, in my Hercules. So we picked up the bags at Dar es Salaam. We went down to um, Malawi, which was the first stop, and the Queen was then going to follow in a Royal Air Force VC-10. We were met by a very excited ground personnel, said, can you tell us which sort of VC-10 it is? And I said, it's a VC-10. And then happily, my engineer knew more about these things than I do, um, and he said, no, it's a super VC-10. He said, ah, right, because what they needed to know is to get the height of the steps right. So we didn't want the Queen having to leap down two or three feet or to climb up. Anyway, the engineer had the work and it, it went up and the Queen came down and, and that, that was absolutely fine. Um, we had a number of other in interesting things uh, as we went around because we were sort of um, on protocol. We were being looked after just like the Royals were. But um, we did get... Um, when they brought the bags back from the first time, the leading footman said to me, um, we've lost one of the bags. Uh -huh. And I thought, I've only had them for 24 hours and I've lost a bag. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, we looked under the cargo netting and sure enough, there was this sort of attache case with ciphers on it and that sort of thing. And we said, is this it? Ah, yes, that's it. And I said, was it important? Did this have the tiara in it or anything like that? I said, no, no, it's got maps of Scotland in it. Oh. And I said, maps of Scotland? I said, well, they're, they're planning for the next trip. She goes back from here and goes up to Balmoral. But there we are. I had not lost one of the <laughs> Queen's bags. But the other thing is we did pick up a lot of the things where um, they, they were given gifts. And so there were spears, there were shields, there was all sort of, sorts of things. That's why we needed my Hercules to take all these extra bags back. So that, that, was, a, that was a bit of fun. Um, can you give any examples of how different military life is uh, to civilian life? I think the biggest thing is that you, are, you sign up for what you're going to do and you're trained for what you're going to do. And this may mean that you're putting not only your life, but also those under your command on the line. So that, that, go, that goes, goes in, in, into the brain. And um, the example that I can think of where um, it, it wasn't my own example, but when we were retaking the Falklands, um, we had the Special Air Services, the SAS, and they were holding regular briefings with the designa designated Hercules crews who were going to take them down to the Falkland Islands. And this was all top secret. I can talk about it now because it's a sufficiently long time ago. Yeah. But when you're Special Air Services, you are going to take risks. And so they would come out with a statement, right, we will need two Hercules, uh, both filled with SAS troopers, because 
we might lose one. It might get shot down, it might crash land, and we might lose um, all our paratroopers. And my colleagues were all thinking, hmm, um, so uh, th this, this is interesting. That night, I think there were a few people phoned home and said, darling, could you just um, get onto the insurance broker and um, just take out a bit more life insurance? Why, darling, what's the matter? No, 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 I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, just give them a crafty call and, and up the life insurance. So um, couldn't, couldn't say anything more about it than that. In my own example, um, there was, when we were taking the Queen around Africa, it was a time when Zimbabwe was being particularly hostile to anything British. Um, and my wife said, well, and there was talk about would the Queen be shot down? Um, and so, you know, they had, they had made preparations for that. He said, yes, made preparations for that. There you are in a military Hercules stooging around. Um, what about you being shot down? So I actually did take out a little bit more term for one year. I, I did actually say, say, can you can you insure me just for a week? I said, well, no, the, the minimum we can insure you for is a, is a year. And they said, and it's quite cheap. So I took out a bit of extra insurance. So that is a difference. You know you might be putting your life on the line. And that comes with the territory. Um. Do you believe that civilians do not fully understand what ve veterans sacrifice for their country? I think part of that I've already put into the, into the previous uh, an answer. Um, and perhaps an infantry, in, an infantry soldier would be able to give a better insight into that yes. because he can actually see the person that he might have just blown someone's head off. You know, sorry to be graphic about it. As a pilot, and let's go back to the Battle of Britain pilots, um, you were one stage removed from it. You weren't shooting at a chap, you were shooting at the aircraft. A nice little courtesy, if you managed to shoot down the aircraft, the Luftwaffe ME109 or whatever it was, it was a fairly common practice to actually follow the aircraft down to see if the chap came out on the end of his parachute and that he was alive and well, and then fly alongside, just giving a little wing waggle as a respect for a fellow combatant. And uh, I think that's rather nice. Yeah, that is, yeah. But um, so that, that's a courtesy. I think that PTSD, post-traumatic stress di disorder, is... Uh, more understood now, and so it should be, because if people have seen these horrendous sights, it must play with your minds. But as a pilot, uh, you are one removed from it. Hmm. Um, you retired at age 70. What was your transition from your military life to civilian life like? Absolutely hectic. So um, the sequence was, I retired on the 3rd of November 2013, we sold the house, we packed up the house, we flew out to Australia on Remembrance Day, a day to remember, the 11th. We arrived on the 13th of November. We moved into a duplex with my younger daughter. Um, I basically paid for the house, but I wasn't allowed to own a house, so I had a deal with my daughter that at the appropriate time she would remember who had put up the money for this house. Uh, there was no problem there, and had a hip replacement, and happy Christmas. <laughs> Five years later, moved into the apartments up, upstairs, the, uh, the uh, over 55 seniors living accommodation. I joined the, uh, uh, the sub-branch of, of Harvard R RSL, and here I am, happy as a sandboy. Right, so... Um, Mention of meeting up with this pilot in the toilet. Actually, we met outside, and he was in the Australian lightweight flying suit, and I was in my Royal Air Force, um, and we only have one weight of suit, and that's for a temperate climate. And bearing in mind that I was based in Changi, you've been through Singapore. Yes. What's it like there? It's so hot. Hot and yeah. sticky. So... Um, 
He was based down in Melbourne, where every now and again it gets a little bit colder, and so we swapped flying suits. So that's why we went into a gent's toilet. So just to put that, that, that to right, in case that's been worrying you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, now uh, I'd like to, for viewers to sit back and enjoy the stories of the other genuine Northern Beaches veterans, ADF veterans, as we salute their service. Thank you very much, Hartnell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.